Gods, now when it comes to Battlestar Galactica, there's enough myths going on inside the show, mixed in with legends and half-truths, that adding anything extra to that could just seem like overkill. And yet, it's kind of what we do as a species. With that in mind, I'm Sean Ferrick for What Culture, and here are 10 most notorious Battlestar Galactica urban legends. Number 10. Was Caprica always meant as a spin-off? Caprica, a prequel set 58 years before the events of Battlestar Galactica, ran for one season in 2010 before being cancelled due to low ratings. It charts the creation of the first Cylons by humans, before the androids turned against them and very nearly wiped them out. Given the obvious connections, you could be forgiven for thinking that Caprica has never been envisioned as anything other than a loyal spin-off. The truth, however, is a bit more complex. In 2006, 24 screenwriter Remy Aubuchon was already working on a film about artificial intelligence for Universal, completely unaware of any plans for a BSG prequel series. When the film proposal was ultimately rejected, Universal put Aubuchon in contact with BSG showrunners Ronald D. Moore and David Icke, who had begun thinking about a wider BSG universe. A meeting between the three men resulted in the basic outline of a show. Had that meeting not occurred, it is possible that what became Caprica would have been a show completely unrelated to BSG. As it was, Caprica ended up in development hell following disagreements between the Sci-Fi Channel and more before a two-hour pilot was finally greenlit in March 2008. Number 9. Just how many battle stars are there? It's easy to assume that, given that there are 12 colonies of COBOL, that there are only 12 of the flagship battle stars as well, one for each colony. This is something Something backed up by Encyclopedia Galactica in, with the non-canonical companion to the original series that was published in 1979. It is also mentioned that 12 battle stars were constructed in the beginning of the 2003 miniseries. However, to say that there have only been 12 is not true. In both the original and reimagined series, there was no definitive decision taken over how many battle stars actually exist. Given the sheer length of the conflict with the Cylons, far more would have to be built. In the years before and during the war with the Cylons, up to 120 battle stars are constructed. However, the majority are destroyed following an elaborate Cylon attack which involves remotely disabling each ship's command navigation program, a strategy that fails to affect Galactica given how it restricts itself to an intra-ship system only. At least 30 battle stars, including the Atlantia, Triton, Solaria and the Columbia, are lost in the first Cylon attack. This loss is what prompts Commander Adama and the Galactica to take charge of the colonial fleet. Number 8. Is there a battle star named Solaria? With so many battle stars constructed and subsequently destroyed, exactly who and what is lost can be difficult to keep track of. As such, fans have started filling gaps themselves, often borrowing from the offshoots of the original 1978 series. The battle star Solaria is but one example. A battle star by that name doesn't make an appearance in either the original or reimagined series. However, it is named in the 1978 novelization of the original run's three-hour premiere, Saga of a Star World, written by Robert Thurston and the series creator Glenn A. Larson. Although the novel is not canon, the ship's existence in the wider BSG universe has been somewhat taken for granted, despite no visual evidence to back this up. Since then, the Solaria has become something of a myth. Like most of the other battle stars, Solaria makes use of Dr. Gaius Baltar's command navigation program, all but ensuring its destruction when said program is revealed to be an underhand Cylon tactic. Subsequently, while not appearing in the original run at all, the 2003 miniseries names the Solaria as one of the many battle stars that is destroyed during the fall of the Twelve Colonies. Number 7. Was the reimagined series the first TV reboot attempt? As the reimagined series is the iteration that has gone down in history, it's easy to think of it as the only reboot of Glenn A. Larson's original show. However, Ronald D. Moore's acclaimed creation is, in fact, not the first attempt at reviving Battlestar Galactica for television, nor will it be the last, as revealed in 2020. Larson himself was talking about a continuation of the show as early as the 1980s, but it took another 10 years for the prospect to get any closer to becoming reality. In 1998, Richard Hatch, who played Captain Apollo, in the original series, tried to revive the show himself with a sequel titled The Second Coming. Hatch racked up at least $50,000 of debt trying to get the project off the ground, and even released a trailer. The project never got any further. Larson, meanwhile, was working on his own reboot, focused on the Battlestar Pegasus. It was set to be produced by Todd Moyer, but when Moyer's 1999 adaptation of Wing Commander bombed at the box office, the idea was abandoned. Pegasus would later play a key role in the reimagined series from the second season onwards. 
Number six, are the Cylons an allegory to Al-Qaeda? The reimagined Battlestar Galactica is heavily influenced by 9-11 and the political climate of the real world is felt in every corner of the show. The tactics that the Cylons use, including the apparent hijacking of the commercial passenger vessel, the Olympic Carrier, directly reference the attacks. It is too simple, however, to bow to the idea that the Cylons and Al-Qaeda are directly allegorical. In a 2006 Rolling Stone interview, Ike warned against such a straightforward interpretation, saying they, the Cylons, have aspects of Al-Qaeda, and they have aspects of the Catholic Church, and they have aspects of America. While the Colonials have a belief system more akin to the polytheistic religion of the Roman Empire, the Cylons' insistence on the existence of one true god is closer to Catholicism than anything else. Moore, meanwhile, stated back in 2005 that there was as much a parallel to the demise of paganism in Europe as there was to the modern war on terror. Battlestar Galactica is a show of such complexity and depth that straightforward comparisons, while inviting, prove almost always to be only one part of the narrative. The undertones of its story are pulled from a wide variety of sources. Number five, did Marvel publish a BSG comic without permission? Marvel Super Special number eight, created by Roger McKenzie and artist Ernie Colan, is a comic tie-in of the original Battlestar Galactica, later adapted into a three-part special adapting the TV show in its entirety. Officially, this is the first of Marvel's adaptations of BSG. Emphasis on officially. The same comic was originally published with artwork by Marvel's Bob Larkin, except Marvel had not acquired the rights for the likeness and script from Universal. When they found out, Universal were on the phone to Marvel, ordering them to pull the comic until they had given their approval. The studio subsequently gave the thumbs up, but not until after hundreds of thousands of copies of the original had been pulped. So far from being the first comic tie-in with BSG, Marvel Super Special number 8 is instead the first comic tie-in that Marvel actually actually had permission to publish. The editor responsible, Richard Marshall, later left Marvel. As an aside, the pilot script from which the illicit comic was adapted from originally saw Dr. Gaius Baltar killed off. In both the original and remastered series, Baltar survives and is given a much more prominent role to play in the story of the colonists' survival. Number four, has Triad always been a card game? Far from being a total revision, Moore and Ike's Battlestar Galactica contains some throwbacks to the original series. One example is a card game called Triad, which uses a 55 count deck of hexagonal cards and Pyramid, a close quarter sport that is a sort of fusion between football, basketball and rugby. Starbuck and Anders bond over a game of Pyramid in Resistance, the fourth episode of season two. You would be forgiven for thinking that these are just direct lifts from the 1978 series, except Moore accidentally swapped the two around. So in the beginning, Pyramid was in fact the card game and Triad was the sport. The cards used to have pyramids on them, but in the reimagined series, these seem to have been replaced with stars. Such is the popularity of both games since Moore and Ike's series was released that it's easy to forget this. Further entrenching the error as fact is the release of triad playing cards that fans of the show can buy. Pyramid has been recreated by some faithful fans and rules are available online, but it's safe to say it hasn't taken off quite in the same way as Quidditch, for example. Number three, the final five are Cylons, right? The final five are a collection of Cylon humanoids whose existence has been forgotten even by most of the Cylon race. The final season of Battlestar Galactica features the question of what a Cylon really is as one of its key themes. Stemming from this disconcerting and, as it turns out, unpredictable investigation is one peculiar theory that the final five are not Cylons at all. The final five are later identified as descendants of an ancient tribe of robot humanoids created by humans thousands of years ago. They seem to be either creations of the Lords of Cobol in their image, or immortal skin job resurrections of the Lords themselves. Either way, the final five, needing to be created and recognised by other Cylons in order to be Cylons, is not actually true. If this sounds complicated, it's because it is. Moore tried to clarify things by saying, the conceptual framework in which these guys are Cylons, it all sort of works once we laid down their individual backstories, but they are different fundamentally. Whether this actually helps to clear up any confusion is debatable, but it certainly puts the rumour of the final five not being Cylons to bed. Number two, is Starbuck a native Capricorn? 
One of Battlestar Galactica's flagship characters, and one who has been described as one of the most complex female protagonists in TV history, Kara Starbuck Thrace, is a fan favourite. In the reimagined series, we only ever see Starbuck on Caprica, on Galactica, or in the skies shooting down Cylons. But her origins are never actually revealed. Was she born and raised on Caprica, as the show would lead us to believe? The series Bible, published by Moore in 2003, reveals that Starbuck was actually born on Pycon, one of the other 12 colonies. However, growing up as a military brat meant she spent most of her childhood moving between the different military bases and installations. As such, she spent very little time on Pycon and isn't particularly attached to it. It could be that Starbuck is like Baltar in considering themselves a naturalised Caprican, having lived there for the largest part of her life. However, while such an explanation is plausible, it's never answered beyond a shadow of a doubt. Of greater importance, though, is the sense of belonging and loyalty that Starbuck exercises in the presence of her crewmates, traits that have helped to make her character legendary. Number one, was Blood and Chrome always meant as a web series? To date, the most recent TV entry in the BSG universe, Battlestar Galactica Blood and Chrome, focuses on Commander Adama in his youth and just after he graduated from Flight Academy. It was first released as a 10 episode series on the now defunct Machinima Inc. This was not, however, the path that Blood and Chrome was always going to take. Sci-Fi first made the announcement in 2010 that a two-hour pilot had been greenlit for production. A year later, their president of original programming, Mark Stern, suggested that the show could in fact be a web series instead of giving it a more conventional TV slot. Deadline confirmed in March 2012 that the series will be online only, despite Richard Hatch and Jane Espenson, a writer on the reimagined series, both saying that they believed a TV deal was still on the table. It was not to be, and while Blood and Chrome was certainly not always envisioned as an online release, that is ultimately how it ended up. Still, all the episodes were later combined into a movie which was broadcast on Sci-Fi in February 2013. DVD and Blu-ray releases of the series followed shortly after. That's everything for our list. Do you reckon we missed anything? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you very much again to the original author of this article. Make sure you give it a check out. And thank you very much to our wonderful editor for making this look pretty. Everyone, remember that you can catch us over on Twitter at WhatCulture, and you can catch myself at Sean Ferrick on Twitter as well. Make sure that you look after yourselves and you look after everyone around you. So say we all.